great to like to welcome you as Executive Director of the 1020 Foundation. And our focus today is to really particularly talk about innovation and the role it plays in systemic change. What conditions are important uh, to allow innovation to take place, do you think? Great question, something that we feel really passionate about because there's a real scarcity of conversation around um, what we need to do to drive innovation in the sector. So first of all, we've got to start with capital. Um, this is the most important thing that if we're not actually acknowledging the need for seed capital around innovation, we're not going to get any progress. Um, leadership and the political legitimacy around innovation in the social uh, sector we feel um, is lacking and really needs those conditions to give it that um, framework uh, to legitimise the work. Um, there's things like um, governance and enabling technology that are some of the foundations that need to come into place. Um, creating the right physical spaces is important. Uh, one of the things we're increasingly talking about is the need to get skills and resources, training right for innovation. And really importantly, I want to say here is that we need communities front and centre in this. You don't, in the business sector, get um, someone designing a new soft drink without bringing the end consumer in. So similarly, when we're talking about innovation here in the social sector, we've got to get those families and uh, communities that are uh, in the disadvantage coming in to participate and drive the design process. So how has the 1020 Foundation particularly focused on getting people in the system to move from the old ways of working into this new innovation incubating space? Um, well, look, again, I've got to start with the money. It's really important that we're actually funding um, leaders to be able to step into this space to drive new practice. Um, I think we've been uh, really focusing on uh, making sure that we're, again, creating the right culture and environment for learning, which includes setting up um, reflect environments for learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning for those communities that are working in this space, that we're talking about um, case studies of success shedding the light on innovation success stories. We've been looking at things like um, reflection and uh, developmental evaluation where we can be asking the learning questions and embedding that in. And really importantly, a focus on measurement that we can start to actually couple innovation alongside some rigorous uh, accountabilities around what's working and what's not working around a results space. What role has convening played in setting this, in building capacity around this process? Yeah, really important question, Lizzie, because convening really is at the centre of driving the innovation. And some people liken it to um, a construction site where you need a project manager to coordinate the architects, the engineers, um, the finance and accountants. So what have you learnt about the art of convening? Oh, God, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of the characteristics that we have observed over time about what is good convening, a lot of it's about leadership. It's actually about sort of starting to think about when we lead from behind, when we lead out front, informal leadership, formal leadership, um, managing complexity, not controlling change. So leadership plays a really big role. Um, I think we've been looking at um, results, results, results. It's a really critical component of convening. Philanthropy definitely plays a role in convening, but what we're also increasingly alongside that seeing is the need for dedicated leaders in community to step up into that convening role. So convening's coming from a lot of places, um, but what we're seeing is that these conveners are, are needing to step into this space with a very new skill set. Some of those things I touched on is this ability to blend technical skills around you know, project managing to a plan alongside these adaptive skill sets where they're sensing and knowing who to bring into the table, when, when to go fast, when to go slow. There's a need to blend cultures of innovation with accountability and rigour. So it's quite a, a complex um, journey they're on. And also there's no roadmap um, in this space for convening. It's not a um, technical blueprint that someone can pick up and apply. So you're really looking for a different skill set and leadership that can actually navigate that complexity. Innovation is really the holy grail for philanthropy. It's the place within which you're likely to have the most impact. Mm. How do you resource the space that you're talking about as a philanthropist to allow this incubation that you're talking about? Yeah, look, we've got to start with the responsibility of funders to look at how they use their dollars most effectively in this space. And I've sort of spoken about that a lot, but that requires a shift in how we fund and where we fund touched on that a bit, it's about moving to longer term cycles, it's the seed funding, the capacity, funding the capacity of leaders to 
move to uh, innovation. There's also um, some values and culture shift that's required to model the sort of innovation that we're looking for. So it's about modelling um, the ability to step in, to trial new things, to build in the reflective practice to understand what's worked and what's not worked and how we can use that from a continuous improvement point of view. Some would argue that innovation is happening all over the sector, um, but that the learning system that ensures the codification and the insight is collected or useful in a way that takes the process forward is what's missing. What's yeah. your sense of the importance of that learning system? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because I think it's fair to say that in the social sector, particularly in the last 10, 20 years, there's been a lot of uh, new models and new projects, new programs. What I would characterise is the shift from experimentation to measured innovation. And what we're really talking about now is the need to blend um, innovation and testing of new models with the discipline and the rigour around measurement. Um, and they go hand in hand, the learning system and the innovation allow us to do that. So really important in all our work that there's investment going into building the rigour around the measurement and the shared measurement so that we can actually get the data to understand what's working, what's not working and use that to drive our decision making for continuous improvement. So it's quite a different um, model, if you like, of innovation when you've got that discipline and uh, the underpinning of it with the data and with the measurement. And I think the other thing that's also really interesting in this space is that many communities are trying to do the same work. So my sense is that learning system is the importance of not only just within the project, but also how you leverage that for the benefit of others. Are you tackling or thinking about that in the context yeah. of 1020's work? Yeah, and look, I, I like the, the way you've intentionally called it a learning system, because that's what it is. We're not talking about isolated buckets of learning. We're really at 1020 really focused on this notion of connecting learning on the ground for broader systems influence. And what we really need to do is to provide the right support infrastructure around the community so that they can come together. Otherwise the learning's falling through the cracks. We need to intentionally bring those communities, provide them with the support that they can come together to learn together, to support each other. But really importantly, that, that community, those community insights and the practice on the ground that is working can actually drive social policy and that broader shift in the system. And this is what we mean when we talk about allowing the communities to drive the change. Mm -hmm.